Good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening, and good evening. Once again, welcome to Providence Christian Ministries. We are so glad that you guys um, felt some time to join us on tonight. For those that are in the house, we say thank you for, for traveling the roads, and we thank God for his grace and his mercy to get you guys here. For all those that are sitting at home watching it on uh, YouTube, Facebook, or the website, Go ahead and send a text message to all your friends. Share, like, uh, make sure you if you give some comments. If you have some questions, leave your questions. Um, we want to make sure that everybody gets everything that they can get on tonight. As you guys can see, we will have a panel of all of the teachers that have taught on the Kingdom Life um, book that we've done in the last, I believe, five, six months or so. Uh, uh, as we say every week, it has been in-depth, it has been um, enriching our lives, it's, it's been allowing us to see ourselves in a, in a different manner than what we've been accustomed to. Uh, we, we've traveled these lives, we've traveled this journey uh, one way or another, but now we are understanding that we need to travel this life in a godly way, in a kingdom life, so that we can influence the places that we walk into on a daily basis. So again, we are thankful you guys joining in with us on tonight. Um, and we're going to go ahead and, and get started. Again, the book that we've studied is called The Kingdom Life, A Practical Theology of Discipleship and Spiritual Formation. It is about uh, becoming whole life transformed in everything that we do, both spiritual and in the natural um, so we're going to kind of just go through some of the, uh, all of the chapters. And if you have any questions, again, you can drop those. We, we form some questions for ourselves as well um, that we're going to kind of talk about. So first off, in the introduction of the book, he gave us the acronym TACT, T-A-C-T, TACT. That was the group that was formed to... Uh, create the change that they wanted to see. So my question is, does anybody remember what TACT stand for? TACT, T-A-C-T. We, we got one in the back? Hold on one second so, so everybody can hear you. Theological and Cultural Thinkers Group. That's it. Theological and Cultural Thinkers. That means getting the biblical foundation as well as understanding the world that we are in. How can we effectively change? And in order to change our atmospheres, we must understand that we have to change ourselves as well. So we're going to go ahead and kind of jump into some things. And if, if anybody on the panel, if you guys want to interject in anything, if anybody has any questions or they want to interject, by all means, let us know. Chapter one. Chapter one was the gospel of the kingdom and spiritual formation. The basis of it all. It starts with that. The gospel of the kingdom and spiritual formation. So the questions that we, that we put up said the first one is what what is the first role we must obtain what is the first role we must obtain and then the second one is a question for anyone to answer is what is the ing or the ion you started the first role is discipleship is learning is understanding what we are called to be the word of god understanding the whole totality of it all. If we're not being the learned ones, then how can we teach? The worst thing someone can do is teach out of themselves and not out of the word. And that's even in, 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 in the natural. If you go into a, 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 an office, and Bishop likes to use the analogy as, as well, um, if, if you're going to teach someone, you can't teach someone shortcuts because it does them no good. It's, it's, it's hurting them in the long run. You have to teach the way it is so that there's an understanding that comes from it. 
And the second question was, what is, what's the ING? As we've gone through this study, what have you begun to do? What actions have you began to take? Whether you're praying more, whether you're studying more, whether you're thinking more, what, what are we doing? I think the, the key here is to understand that whole process of doing and, and becoming. Uh, it's, an, it's an action uh, that has to be taken. Um, you mentioned the first question being what's the, what's the first role, and that is becoming a disciple. Well, Jesus said this. He said, uh, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Um, spiritual formation, and, and, you know, we keep saying spiritual formation, but in a nutshell, it is the forming of the life of Christ in us. Paul said that, that uh, I live uh, I'm in, nevertheless, he said, I died, but I live, and the life I live, I live through faith in the Son of God. And so he lives his life now through the life of Christ dwelling in him. In order to fulfill that or live it to any full measure, there has to be an understanding that, that there's a death process that takes place. As I learn of him, I become more like him. I then lose what I was as I become what he is. You know, uh, and that's in a nutshell. But I think when we look at scripture, it takes us beyond just coming to church. It takes us beyond just you know, praying over our food and praying before we go to sleep. It's beyond that. It's about relationship. It's, it's, it is a lifestyle, and it's about relationship if we're going to become one. We've contented ourselves with the idea of a relationship with God, which makes us feel okay. That means I've done my part. It's like coming to church on Sunday. I did my part. And now I can do whatever I want to do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and I'll come back Sunday. And it doesn't matter that Monday I never pray, Tuesday I never <laughs> pray, Wednesday I never pray, Thursday I never read the Bible, Friday I never did it, Saturday I never found myself out being a witness for Christ. In other words, I did nothing that reflectively uh, image, is an image of Christ except I went to church. And we hold one another hostage to just the concept or the idea of church without any real transformational process taking place. So when you say, what are you doing? The idea is what steps are we taking that are, that is facilitating our growth, our development, our transformation, our becoming, what is facilitating that? And so for, for, for me, that's what's made this so powerful because the study has taken us back to the basic ABCs of the whole concept of the New Testament. First of all, we know that the mindset and the heartbeat of God is, is about winning souls. That's what it's about, and that's what we have to be about. Secondly, it, it is about our transformational process so that we become effective soul winners. So we become effective witnesses uh, for, for Christ so that we're no longer telling people what they should look like, but we are demonstrating what it looks like to have the formation of Christ uh, in us. And so I think that's the one takeaway from that chapter is to simply understand what it means to, to uh, be formed, you know, to allow Christ to be formed in us. Lastly, I will say this. The question then becomes how long does it take to be formed? Lifelong. Lifetime, lifetime. We will spend the rest of our lives becoming, the rest of our lives becoming. And I'm going to tell you now from experience, as you're becoming, it's so important and so powerful that you allow God to help you in that process to become, to show you things you need to see and understand. Because if you don't allow him to do it that way, it'll get exposed in other ways. Okay. And then you find yourself. You find yourself raw yeah. 
you find yourself out there because God couldn't get it to you the way he wanted to. He couldn't get you to lay on the table long enough for him to do surgery on you. And so when it comes to the formation of Christ, it's a lifelong process. I will ever be becoming. Thank God I'm not what I used to be, Amen. but I'm still Amen. not all that I'm supposed to be. Paul said it like this, and then I'm going to turn that loose. Paul said, uh, I'm, I'm striving, mm -hmm. I'm forgetting the past, and I'm reaching, um, trying to become, trying to apprehend that that I've been apprehended of. And so I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling. That prize is my total formation, me being totally formed in, in him. Amen. So that was chapter one in a, in a nutshell. And if we can, we're going to move to um, chapter two. Do the mic. Was a discussion. <laughs> chapter two was a discussion. Chapter two. <laughs> try, try that. Chapter two. I apologize. Well, be ye ever ready, huh? Yes. It is. And I take that rebuke. <laughs> chapter two was a discussion of communities of grace. And I specifically like this chapter because it was ever uh, an ever evolving reflection of Christ himself. Um, grace is a community. Um, you enter in contrary to the majority's belief that it's, grace is primarily about salvation and doctrine. And so until we understand that concept, it's kind of buried beneath the rubble of misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. Then we're able to really embrace what truly was the intent of Christ himself as he walked in the earth. We see that demonstration. Chapter 2 is a reflection of Jesus' promise in John 13 and 35. By this shall all men know me, that you are my disciples. When we get to the place of understanding the, the intent of us being here was to look like him, it changes the game of how people see the church when we become. And so I want to go on to talk about how it says in that same scripture, if you have love one for another, if you have love one to another, there's an if. So it tells us that it's not subjective, subjective to everybody. And so that process of transforming and being formed forever allows us to kind of be morphed into what he intended. Spiritual work transformation is rooted in a relationship with God and one another. Communities of grace and trust help us to discover and define who we are and how we shall live to trust others um, through grace, humility, dignity, and justice. Communities of grace and trust provide access to gain permission to allow others to love us as well as we can love them, but we cannot love others until we accept love. And oftentimes it becomes a cul-de-sac. You know how we live in those areas where you can just go in and turn around. You can't get any other access. It's just a dead end. That's what happens when we don't receive the love to move forward, to extend that expression of God's love to others. And so we, that ever, we, we're going to talk about being formed continually throughout this book review, but you'll find that you have to be formed into the next level of formation to even experience, to express, to express Christ as he intended we give people what we have sometimes, and that's not what God intended. Um, to further go on, the kingdom benefit when the invitation is accepted it is life-changing, not just for you, but for others. Uh, they get to experience the love of Christ the way he intended. We get to expand, expand, ex we get to express, ex we get to experience that as well. I need some water. I, we get to experience that as well in that process but meanwhile we get sharpened because we learn the true intent of submission mm -hmm. submitting one to another thank you submitting one to another that's when we see that we cannot function unless and until we receive love ouch you can't fully function until you receive the love of christ you're kind of like in that cul-de-sac and we don't realize that sometimes. Receiving love by design is to be experienced with, before extending love. It's a prerequisite. Mm -hmm. We love because he first loved us. That's according to 1 John 4 and 19. It requires trust. A core principle of learning to receive love, the degree to which I trust you is the degree to which I receive you. So how much I trust you is how much trust I receive. So it's a reciprocal, and community does that. Community creates the, opportunity, creates the opportunity for us 
to kind of try that muscle or of a trust so it can be stronger in receiving trust from others. And this is an ongoing process. Um, it also talks about in chapter two that learn to love, allow others to love you on the terms is part of what it means to in Ephesians 5.21, I just talked about that, submitting yourself one to another out of reverence for Christ. See, it's not even about us. When we are unable to trust, we never experience love. When one elects to live in a mental, emotional cul-de-sac, it cancels this demonstration of love and eliminates communication from building fluid love. Um, there were two questions that came up in chapter two that kind of stood out for me. Where have you experienced an environment of grace and truth? And also, what communities have you experienced damage in? And my answer was the same, in church. I learned to die in church to some degree, but I learned to suffer in church to another degree. And that developed me in another level of understanding what the community was designed for. So oftentimes we hit walls, we hit walls of rejection and walls of abandonment or walls of whatever we encounter, we tend to kind of, re, we kind of revolt back to ourselves and hide in that wound that needs to heal from that impact. Mm -hmm. And so important for me, those communities, good, bad, or indifferent, they help us. We get to experience the love of Christ either way it goes. Mm -hmm. You know, either we get to extend it and receive it, mm -hmm. or we get to bump into what is not Christ and learn to know it. Who said, that's not God. <laughs> and so it's so important that communication is a culture and an environment, though interchangeably. Environments are more powerful than words, and actions speak louder than words. Jesus is the centerpiece of the community of grace, and he alone invites each of us in. Jesus is our vision, he is our inviter, and he is our savior. And when we extend that expression of him to others, he gets the glory. I do have a question that I, um, how do we begin the process of trusting a community? Because we're talking about community, a community of grace, um, receiving love so that we can then become love ourselves. Because that was the whole idea of, of the Lord. Not just that we express love, but that we become, we epitomize what love is. How do we begin the process of trusting when we have built in us through our hurts, uh, a inability to trust people. And our inability to trust people also causes us not to be honest with them because we don't trust them. So how do we start? I can only share my own personal journey, and it was learning to trust God. When I got to the place of really understanding that everything works to my good, that's despite what I see. That's despite who I encounter, what I'm subjected to. But learning to trust that, he was willing to forsake all just for me. So for me not to trust that act of love, that act of love, which gives me access to trusting him, that I can be trusted with others. So for me, it was very practical. It wasn't an overnight success, no. It took a lot of bumping into individuals, experiencing things, that would allow me to understand that God is intentional. He is so intentional. And me getting to a place of freedom in my heart through unforgiveness, through dealing with that rejection button over and over again, mm. he's coming for something that I need mm. to avail to him <laughs> and trust him with so that I can trust others. I mean, you use another word than rejection. Because that, that rejection, it, it, it hit me. And so when, you, when you're saying that, when you have to give trust and allow to be trusted, that, that circle. Rejection is one of those things that I don't want to be rejected, so the chances of me rejecting somebody is slim to none. But it sets me up for failure because what, I, what I've done then is expected something from someone that's not going to come. So if, if, if I have to get to that place where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow God, and, and Bishop just used it earlier, lay on that table long enough for, for God to do some surgery in me, I'll get to the point where it's going to be like, you know what, I'm going to attempt this 
whether I'm rejected or not. And I'm going to pray that I have a community that's going to grace me enough to understand that, hey, he's stepping out of what he would normally do. So let's accept that. But if I, I, I got to step out there first. Can I say this, though? And I want everybody to be clear about this. When we have a wounding in the area of rejection, we come into a community to where it's supposed to be trusting. Uh, there's supposed to be grace there. There has to be a change of our minds so we're not looking for rejection. Because when we're looking for rejection without trying, we do things to be rejected. Okay? And that's a mindset. That's a mental thing. I have to ascend to the place when God brings me into a community that I'm going to take that chance. I'm going to take that opportunity uh, uh, and trust someone and not expect to be rejected. Therefore, I will have the kind of attitude and mindset that will cause me not to do the dysfunctional things that would cause me to get the only thing I've had, and that was rejection. Yeah. I know. I just wanted to say that um, when you talk about when I don't like something, when I don't like rejection, I consciously don't reject, but the boundaries reject. Yes. It's the boundaries established that reject others. Your inability to like conflict. You don't like this. You don't. Those things are forms of rejection, and it keeps you build something that keeps you safe. But it also keeps you in an unhealthy place Amen. and keeps those out that have been called to help you with that healing Amen. process out. So it's so important. And we, when we establish those things that we don't like, we move closer to things that are going to hit them more frequently. Wow. That's good. That's good. Mm. We're in the chapter three. Chapter three. <laughs> okay. Chapter three. The transformational process. Uh, this chapter um, was basically, it's talking about two different, um, two different lives that we often live um, in church, outside of church. But one of the things that he talked about, um, and this is one of my questions, is can, a, can the spiritual disciples, can the spiritual dif disciplines become an impediment to formation. And oftentimes, we don't realize that the way we were brought up, the way we were taught, um, and I can say this from a Baptist mindset, that we just thought it was just about salvation. It just stopped at being saved. Like, I'm just going to go to church. I'm going to sit on a pew. I'm going to listen to the pastor, and the pastor going to do right. I ain't got to do right. I ain't got to live right. You don't need me. You don't need my help. And the church is going to run by the, the ones who are saved and, you know, more filled with the Holy Ghost. Because, you know, you get those like, oh, you say, say. <laughs> well, we all say. <laughs> so it's talking about two different things. And, in, and it is a hindrance when we stop at the conversion center. We have to go past that and become disciples. We have to come, become past that to realize what we're called for. And that's the agenda that God called us to, is to redeem those that are lost. That's our main purpose and the mission for us being here. And so Christ died so that we can help save the world. So I would just say, you know, get past that, you know, I'm just in church. I can't be used. I'm not good enough. And begin to, you know, get busy with what God has assigned you to do. Um, the other question was, how do we invite people into the life of discipline so that they become life-giving and integrated life rather than additional tasks to check off on to-do lists? Many of us have been guilty of being busy and working and working, and you just check off Check off, check off, check off. But one of the things that it talks about in the book, it talks about grace. And that's to accomplish what we cannot accomplish. But it also talked about repentance. And I think we need the both of those because that helps us understand the life of Christ. Because without grace, we cannot do it on our own. And without repentance, we don't have the ability to turn. And that's our way of saying to God that, hey, 
we are really uh, mature in areas to where we can walk them out, but it's also the doorway to life and freedom. And I think that's been one of the hindrance to where um, having a self-righteous mind to feel like, oh, okay, well, I'm saved. I, you know, I can live, I can do what I want. But when we realize that repentance is the doorway to our freedom, that means that we can go to God because God understands us and he knows us. And that puts us back in a right standing so that we can walk out what God calls us yeah. to. So I believe that's one of, those are two key things that will put us in a position to a life of freedom so where we can walk out discipleship. So this process is an active process right. that's continual right. on a daily basis. Right. <laughs> and so no matter what plateaus I reach of maturity, there are still levels to be obtained. There's still development. There's still growth to be done. And so, that's, oh, go I'm ahead. Sorry. I oh, was going to say, that's one of the things he also talked about in the book. Um, a lot of times we, we, we look at the place that we're trying to achieve and we don't have that training mentality of maturity. And that's one of the things that he talked about when he used um, the example of uh, playing the piano or wanting to play the piano and you're not as skilled at it. You're not going to just go and try to play the piano. You're going to go through the you become more skilled when you become trained. And that's how our lives are. It's about that maturity level, uh, uh, Gary, um, and walking it out. It's, it's that training process to understand that the more and more we do it, the more and more skillful we become at it. So it's not one of those places where we just arrive, but if we have the mentality to understand that, hey, I'm in, I'm in, a, I'm in this training module to where once I... When, once I get this, I can learn something else. So you don't get discouraged about where you are and you don't feel like you can't achieve it because our maturity is daily. I think we have a question out there. Hello. Does the trials in your life have a divine purpose? Ooh. <laughs> is that for me? <laughs> says all things work together for uh, those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So everything that I go through, there's no waste in God. He can use everything, even the things that I got in on my own and the things that he allowed to happen can be used for his kingdom. I think one of the mistakes, though, that we make is to believe that everything that happens to me, God wanted it to happen. And that's a, that's a misnomer. That's a misconception. But we can say this. Everything that happens to me, God is aware and he's there to help me with that. If I will allow the circumstance to do in me what God wants to do. Sometimes it's a process. Sometimes there are things through hardships, through trials that open places in us that God wants to get to. And so he takes the opportunity to get into that place because it's open, to get into that place because it's wounded, to get into that place uh, uh, because it's, it's in pain, it's bleeding uh, emotionally. And so God has the opportunity to get in. We have to learn how to let him in. We have to learn how to allow that process to take place. And so our, our, can our trials work together for our good? Uh, can they have divine purpose for us? Yes, they do. As long as we don't assign everything that we go through to God, because some things are a result of our own bad decision making. Uh, and when we do, we then begin to see God as a vengeful dad, <laughs> you know, picking on me by sending me through something or punishing me. And the enemy is so crafty. We go way back. I remember what I did back. I'm being punished for that. That's just not, he's not like us, so he doesn't work like us. And he doesn't have to use those kind of tactics to get your attention. God has another way to get your attention without having to put you through petty issues and trials and, and tribulations in, in life. So I, I agree with that. We just have to make sure that we don't accuse our Heavenly Father of being uh, a petty dad. Amen. All right, so we're going to hit the chapter four, spiritual formation. Right before you go there, I got to ask this question, and I need you to answer it for me. Based on the whole transformational process, 
how much of an involvement do you think the lack of transformation is in the abandoning of the pursuit of God that takes place within the church? Maybe I need to make that even clearer. If I do, I will. Um, you know, uh, because there are points in which people who've been in, it's almost like being married for 40 years and then 50 years and then getting a divorce. And it's like, what happened? S something wrong with that. I mean, there's something really, really wrong with that. But it's easy to understand. And I want to I want to know, does the same principle apply to a life pursuit or what should be a life pursuit of God? When that doesn't happen, can we have the same effect? Because when two people spend 50 years raising kids and raising grandkids and getting people on their way and all of a sudden look at each other and decide we are incompatible and <laughs> we're not compatible and we want to go our separate ways, uh, is it possible that, th that the growth process, the transformational process that they were supposed to be in all of their lives stop happening and they wake up one day and cannot find a reason to be together? So, so is that same principle applicable when it comes to our relationship with God? Yes. Yes, most definitely. I think sometimes we don't realize that our lives should be a life commitment to Christ. And the choosing of that is just like with marriage. Marriage is a covenant. And so when we abandon the covenant, then we're out there basically doing our own thing and we're on our own. So with God, I'm for better or for worse, for sickness. I mean, nothing, nothing can separate me from him. Okay, nothing. I, I just, I just wanted to make sure that that was clear for me, and maybe clear for someone else to understand, because that's what happens all too often. As a pastor, I've seen it so many times, where someone who's on a path, especially when they're on that fast track and they're hungry, you know, when in those first beginning stages, man, it is so easy because much of many of the things that we allow God to deal with, we were tired of them anyway. <laughs> but it's like that new car smell. It's then after a while it get boring. <laughs> it's like, oh, no, you're not doing this. Oh, I, sh I should have done this, or I should not have made that mistake. So you and, have to do something else to get And that so smell. you have, but you have to be intentional. You have to be engaged. <laughs> I like it. She said you got to clean up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you got, you got to be intentional. If you don't do the maintenance on your car, if you don't take care of your car, then your car going to stop running. And that's what normally happens. We get so excited. Come it's on, just God. like with the new boyfriend and the girlfriend. After it gets boring, that person is not doing what you need them to do. The same thing with marriage. You lose that commitment because you forget the purpose of what you were called for and what you were called to. If that car was supposed to be yours, if it was a <laughs> blessing then, it's a blessing now. And that's what we, we fail to realize. You know, in my situation... I can honestly say, for me, it's the encounter. And it talks about it in the book. Our encounters are different. And encounters will change your life. My life, with my life was being on the line and God saved me. It wouldn't, it, it's not an option. I don't, I, I'm not compromising that. When we got married, it wasn't an option. So it's where we are. Is it an option or is it not an option? What do we choose? So we don't get boring with God. You don't get boring with it. You, you stop getting bored. You stop, and it becomes boring when you're not engaged. And I think a lot of us can look at that. Our lives began to deter. Wow. You know, they, they went another way because we weren't engaged. We weren't engaged, and we weren't pursuing Christ the way we wanted to um, or the way we thought we should in the beginning because maybe we weren't getting what we were expected to get. But when we continue to do that, we begin to stay on that path. And we, we begin to receive the same things that we got from the beginning. So we don't lose the thrill. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so with the new car smell thing, I can't just run out and buy a car freshener and put it in there and, and have it made. That's what you're saying, basically. Right, you're right, Ma. <laughs> <laughs> you can't make it back up. You don't get that smell no more once it go away. <laughs> well, you... I was just going to say, you can buy that in the store. It's not the same. Um, but I will say this. New car smell won't help the smell if you got old garbage on the back seat. There you go. There you go. It, it won't. If you, if you got wasted, you waste milk on the carpet, a new car smell is not going to change that. You got to clean the carpet. And I think that's what happens 
by the Holy Spirit through the word of God, there's a constant uh, place and point of, of cleansing. Jesus said that, that um, through his word, we are cleansed. We are clean. And so I think it's a constant bar uh, uh, barrage of baptizing ourselves in the word of God and allowing the Holy Spirit to do the cleansing process that helps us stay in a place to where we can hold a pleasant odor and aroma. Yeah. Chapter four. <laughs> this is spiritual formation from the inside out. This is going to be Bishop and Sister Charita. <laughs> One of the first things I um, want to One of the, uh, the first things that stood out for me uh, in this chapter, it talked about this not being um, a sprint. That uh, spiritual tr uh, transformation from the inside out is a lifelong process. He kept uh, reiterating that, that thing throughout this book. It's not something that is going to be a one-time you know, hit, hit and, and we, we're going to go. It's going to be a lifetime. As we experience different things, we were going to have to take those experiences and, um, and, and grow from them with the word of God. Uh, one of the questions that, um, that we um, got from this, chap this chapter was, how necessary is the word of God um, for the transformation from the inside out? And um, the author um, states that God works both inside and outside, well, inside out and out, outside in. He works inside through prayer, Bible reading, and the practice of most spiritual disciplines. But he states that transformation begins in the part of the immaterial nature called the mind. Uh, in other words, on the inside. Romans 12 and 2 from the Amplified reads, do not be conformed to this world or this age, fashioned after or adapted to its external superficial customs, but be transformed or changed by the renewal of your mind, uh, by the new ideals it, and the new attitudes, so that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and the perfect will of God, even in the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in, your, in the, his eyesight for you. So transformation first begins in the mind, but the, the mind is renewed or transformed through the word of God. Um, so change begins in the mind. It is spirit, and it starts with God's words acting on our minds. And after God's word starts to act on our mind, there should be an external or action that comes from that transformation. Because transformation, true transformation, changes how you act on the outside. If there is no change in your behavior, then there's no true transformation. Um, <laughs> so, so let me get this now. So I'm saved now, and I'm Holy Ghost feel. Okay, I might even speak a little tone. So, at this point. Do I have to have or do I have to develop a new set of behaviors, um, um, movements, uh, steps, processes in order to accommodate this new life? Or can I now do what I used to do and hope that the new life keeps me safe? <laughs> no, definitely not. Because, I mean, if you don't exercise that new thing or practice even in speaking in tongues, you lose it. it does, it's not become, um, you, you cannot say that I am this, but I act another way. Mm -hmm. Your actions has to change, else it, it, won't, um, it won't sustain so let, that you've learned. So let me, take a, you let me take a little bit deeper, because I don't, I don't, I'm not necessarily asking about my actions that are response to something. I'm talking about my habits that I had before I got saved. Yes. Now that I'm saved, I'm still doing the same things that I used to do the same way I used to do it. And I'm hoping that the present 
moment of salvation will cause me to get a different reaction from the same old actions. As you grow in the word, the word brings about a conviction, not a condemnation or mm -hmm. guilt, but a conviction. So that as I walk out this thing called salvation, as I walk out my life in holiness and in righteousness, there's a quickening that says, uh oh, that's not right, <laughs> you know? And so the word uh, is, uh, is, re is a for reproof. Yes, yes the two is for, yes. So I did, and I asked you a question. No, no, you, you answered the question. <clears throat> I just wanted to make sure that we get a clear, clear view of that inside-out transformational process, inside-out, outside-in, how God's working on the totality of our existence or our being. But it requires that we make changes. It, re it requires that we do things differently. Because it's that old adage, if I keep doing the same things the same way, I'm going to keep getting the same results. I don't care how saved, I don't care how Holy Ghost feel, I'll get the same results if I keep doing the exact same thing. So now I'm in the process in my inner transformation of setting up new habits, new movements, a new way of doing things so that I don't get taken back into that place. Because, you know, when you first get saved, you're on such a high. You're on such a high that, and when you have those impactful moments with God, it puts you on that high, and you run that thing till you run out. You know, honeymoons don't last as long as they used to last. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They get married, and they be on the honeymoon, and they are so excited. And usually, it used to, a long time ago, it used to last for, for a month or two, you know, but now they're on the honeymoon, and three days later, they fight. <laughs> I mean, they, they're fighting, sleeping in a different room. So it doesn't last. That high in this high-octane world of moral decay does not last without me doing the necessary things to create a different environment for my relationship with God and my inner transformation. that we had um, um, in this study, intentional and consistent. That's good. In, being intentional in the way um, that I study, intentional in the way that I tr uh, walk out the word that I'm studying, consistent in reading the word so that it dwells in me richly, and consistency bring, uh, breeds uh, success. Mm. I can't be a bodybuilder if I don't consistently lift weights. Mm -hmm. So I can't build my spiritual body if I don't consistently digest the word. And not only digest, but he, not only be able to hear the word, but do the word. If I just got to say, you be my mentor. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I would need someone to remind me of those necessary things that keep me in process. You know, because as, as I was saying with, with Keisha, I think the greatest failure uh, within the body of Christ when it comes to relationships of, of, of the people of God with God is a failure to stay in process, a, stale, a failure to stay alert. You know, because even as she mentioned with 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 a marriage, um, you're looking at two people who are in an evolutionary process. Well, as they are evolving, uh, their response to each other, their thoughts concerning one another has to evolve, too. If not, they get to a place emotionally that the relationship cannot support. Mm -hmm. And so it requires that. But that that's that's good. That. Yeah, that helps. That should help. Others understand how to allow God to do that inside out process. And the, the scripture said, uh, one of the scriptures says that uh, Paul encouraged Timothy with the word, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good word. The word of God that we know uh, of it is the basis for being complete in him. In other words, the word initiates a four-step process of transformation. Put simply, it teaches us what is right, rebukes us what is not right, correction tells us how to get right, and training shows us how to stay right. So we just write. Mm 
<laughs> right. <laughs> okay. The right family. So, and, and the other question was, um, uh, what does it mean to be formed in the image of God? In Genesis 1 and 27, on the last day of creation, God said, let us make man in our own image, in our likeness. The creation of man was done with God's personal touch. In Genesis 2 and 7, we see where God formed Adam from the dust and gave him, gave him life by sharing his own breath. Man is unique, unique among all God's creations, having both material body and an immaterial soul uh, and spirit. In Genesis 1 and 26, God said, let us make man in our own image to be like us. They will reign over the fish um, in the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals, and so forth. So man was created uh, to represent God in the earth as a ruler, having dominion. Um, we are the little K kings as he is the big K king. He is king of kings. So we have dominion uh, and rule, not ownership, but dominion and rule in the earth. And that's how, that's why he wanted us, he made us in his image mm -hmm. so that we can manage um, the kingdom here. As it is in heaven, let it be on, on earth as it is in heaven. So it's not the express, I mean, the image that you've seen in the mirror, the mirror, but we are the we should be the expressed image that what people see when they um, see us in the earth. Especially if we are the ones that are calling ourselves Christians and um, disciples of Jesus Christ. We are the people of God. Then we should be acting like the people of God. That's the, that's the image of our lives. Well, as you get ready to take us into chapter 5, I do want to leave four with this thought. Galatians 4 and 1 says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, as long as he is immature, differs nothing from a servant. Though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father, even so we, when we were children. So the idea is, is that the most important element to our walking in real authority uh, and our being uh, agents of transformation is tied to our maturity level. Um, God will only release us to move uh, as we uh, grow and mature to handle that authority, to handle that power. Without it, there's someone, governors and tutors were designed to help children until they got to maturity. They governed their things and they taught them how to handle certain things. So there was a process they went through. The faster we allow, the more, the, the more we allow God, that's a better way to put it, to do what he wants to do in us, bringing us to greater levels of maturity, then we begin to experience those things that are what you're talking about, dominion rule and reign. Um, one of the reasons that we don't reign and we don't rule in dominion is because of immaturity. Uh, immature uh, people in authority are dangerous. Immature people with power do damage. And so this is the, the whole idea is for us to become empowered by being mature believers um, in Christ. I think in this day, uh, and what we see in, in the climate that is in mo most imperative that we become mature so that not only as we um, send out our prayers to, you know, the, the political arena and other um, tables, that we now can be, be seen at the table so that we can be the express image of God at the table so that we will have dominion uh, in the areas of the seven mountains. Not only are we saying, you know, we're gonna pray, we're gonna, God, they need to see us at the table. We need to be at the table so that they can see the expressed image of God, the character of God. Amen. So chapter five is about the whole life transformation. And if you guys have picked up anything that we've been saying 
throughout the study and even on tonight that this is a process. The transformation is a process. And that's what this chapter talked about as well, is being the whole life transformation, not just about what people see in church or when you're doing ministry, but what they see in your everyday life. You should not be one way here and another way at home. Um, and I know many people have used examples of, of how you come into the, the building and church and everybody see you and you're always happy. And when you get home, you know, they're like, why you don't, you don't laugh, you don't smile, you don't talk, you don't do anything like that. It's because there is a separation. And a lot of the times we, we build up those walls to say, when I'm out in public, I have to be this way. When I'm at home, I can let loose and be myself. We are supposed to be ourselves everywhere we go. That is what the whole life transformation is. And he talked about it in, in the entire chapter of it being a journey. Because sometimes, even some of the examples we, we've used this evening, sometimes when we are so accustomed of doing things or saying things or reacting in a certain way, um, We'll do those. We'll, we'll continue to do them and like, I'm saved, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, but I still enjoy doing this. And that's when that conviction comes in that says, no, that's not who you are. Because if you do this now, you're going to mess around and do this somewhere else. And then somebody's going to be like, whoa, he was just up there praying or she was just up there doing this. And it's, it's the whole life transformation that has to, to really take place. Um, do we have the questions for chapter five? Just engage the audience with them. Because I really would like to know, I would like to hear from someone um, if they can identify gaps in their spiritual life um, and in your common everyday movements. Can you recognize gaps, places? I, I would really like to hear from someone. Um, rather than just put myself out there. Because <laughs> I ain't got no gaps, okay? <laughs> I'm complete in him. <laughs> A gap demonstrator. <laughs> and so I can, I can definitely, um, many years of gaps. Um, some because of disobedience. Some because of a lack of understanding. And, and more so, some because of fear. But what I realized is when I identified where I was not moving the way God's word said I should have, I had to search within myself to see what part of me was not moving with the word. Yeah. And, and, and coming to that realization, you identify, I look nothing like what he said I should look like. And why? And so for me, I can say there are places in my, as a parent, I could have moved differently if I didn't move in the system of what I had seen. Um, as a professional, Fear hindered me from elevation in many places. As a leader, um, not utilizing my voice in the capacity that it was called to hindered others from following the word differently. And so many gaps in my life, and I, I talk about them openly, but I know that for certainty where the light hits darkness, when light hits darkness, it penetrates it. And it opens up an understanding that, whoa, this is a shadow. There should be light here. And it gives me access to the word and also to conform. Formation, spiritual formation is really your spirit, man, forming to become something that God intended. And so if we're ever evolving in that walk, we come to understand that those gaps, they may have been spaced out over time. They close in. That's our foundation that you can walk on without those gaps being a constant reminder where you come from. There's freedom in knowing I survived this, that, and the other. You know, and got to a place of understanding, hey, I can be what he said. That's good. Anybody else? There is a there is a second question. What mask was uncovered? And what steps have you taken to unmask it? <laughs> oh, don't know what don't nobody want to get out there. <laughs> Community of grace, community of grace. Here's your opportunity. For me, um, I would say facing my own brokenness, you know, trying to, my mask was that I had it all together. And, you know, and 
as I started to, to realize or to face the brokenness instead of trying to run away from uh, healing in the area, trying to get to another area, I realized that I couldn't. There was a process that I had to go through in that brokenness in order for me to, to get to where I knew I was supposed to be. I couldn't skip that. And in my uh, trying to skip, skip over the process, I was causing myself more pain and, and, and grief and frustration because I was, it, I think it takes more energy to hide and to, in, in letting go. There's a freedom in allowing God to do what he needs to do in that broken place. Yeah. So the mask had to come off. Because yeah. I wouldn't, I don't think really feel fooling anybody anyway. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah. Uh, with me, with the study of this book, um, it has opened up to me my blind spots more than anything. Uh, the places and areas that, you know, Basically, we all think that we are doing well until we are confronted with those blind spots. And this transformational process for me has been exposing my blind spots more and more. And that gives me an opportunity to turn them over to the Lord and, and work on them myself. But I've been hit in many areas since we began this study that, you know, I thought I was doing well. I thought I was okay. <laughs> and understanding this book and the transformation process, I'm like, whoa, that needs to be worked on. That, that, I've had many blind spots exposed. Yeah. <laughs> Not me, though. I have a friend. Okay, we get that straight. I've got a. I have a friend who. Um, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. I have a friend who experienced so many disappointments coming up that the mask for them was that everything's okay. It also hindered the friend from confronting when necessary. Um, it. 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 It hindered them from being honest about their feelings, <laughs> their emotions. No, I'm not. Oh, <laughs> oh, you my friend. Okay, it was Gary. Yeah, and it, it, it hindered about wounding others because of his own woundings, things that he had gone through. So he became a crusader for everybody. Exactly. And so he wore the mask that everything was okay. And so he created an, an atmosphere to where people thought he didn't need anything that everything's always good, that he could do all things, hope all things, and do all things, last all things, jump tall bills. I looked in the mirror and reached him to tell him that he did not have to be Superman. And he took the cape off, but he put it in a drawer, and he would slip it on and slip it off, slip it on, slip it off. And so he, he had to learn over time, thank God, that he got smart finally, to burn the cape up, he can actually make people aware of his displeasure of something that should not have been pleasurable anyway without being offensive and destructive. That's a part of that whole life transformation for my friend, and I'm glad he's free. <laughs> know that you're my brother and I am your sister I'll be your friend because <laughs> that was exactly what happened but I didn't know how to put it into work doing that but I'm still trying to get it together because now that I know who I am and I begin to let you know that it's not okay for you to hurt me it's not okay for you to do me any kind of way Amen. I'm crazy I got an issue Something wrong with me. So I just need y'all to keep me lifted in prayer with that. And I'm going to work on it. I'm going to be like, I'm your sister, so I'm going to take it back. <laughs> Listen, I, I, I have so, man, look, I love you guys. I really, really do. Because I have so, so enjoyed this. I wish we had more time. Uh, we, we don't. We're fresh out of time. 
uh, somebody looked at their watch for the first time and wasn't saying, yeah, it's like they were saying, look, we got time, and I appreciate that. Thank you. But uh, we're fresh out of, out of time. I want you to know, guys, we, we, we love you. I do want to say this to the last person that was on. Uh, understand the, the, the reason we need community is to help us stay balanced. Right. Because without community, we do go from everything's all right, everything's all right, um, everybody's stepping stone, everybody's lollipop, to all of a sudden forget the world. Screw the world, and I want to I wanna tell everybody, if you breathe hard, I'm going to put you in your place. It ain't happening. There ain't no grace here. There's no, there's no forgiveness here. You mess with me. It's a fight. It's a fight. And so that's what we need, community that helps us stay balanced, somebody that helps us learn how to get out of the ring and know we don't have to fight. We can be strong. We can be courageous. We can be uh, direct, but we can be loving, and we can be forgiving. Amen? Amen. Amen. So if, if, if there's not any last words, we'll we'll pick up next week. Uh, we can finish next week because we got through five chapters. Amen. So we can finish on next week. I hope you join us um, as we kind of wrap up this study. It's an ex been an exciting time, but don't don't be weary. Don't worry about it. We're going to launch a new study in um, in the first week of. Well, mm, yeah. I will announce it next next week and Sunday, but we're going to launch a new study that will be as impacting and powerful that will help us continue this process of spiritual growth and development. Uh, and so I'm excited about that. I know I know they are um, uh, on the screen. You'll see ways in which we can give. I don't need these. I'm just putting them on. Um, <laughs> ways in which you can be a blessing to this ministry, uh, to, to help us do the will of God, uh, to carry out the will of God, it requires finances. And so we are asking that you would continue to be faithful. Remember, too, we're getting ready for a, 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 a serious uh, building fund push uh, the end of February. That last, that third or fourth Sunday in February, we're going to have a, uh, a super giving Sunday. Uh, and we're believing God that we're going to knock out some debt. The Bible says, oh, no, man, nothing but to love him. And that's all we want to do, love him. We don't want to owe him. And so we want to try to get that out of the way so we can do greater kingdom things, more of the things that God has purposed for us to do. So we love you. We thank God for you. We'll definitely see you on next week uh, as we again uh, take a walk in the Word. <laughs>